Welcome to lecture number eight. Today's topic will cover the Great Depression and New Deal, roughly from 1929 to 1940. There are many important issues to address with this subject matter. First, we'll investigate some of the conditions faced by the American people during the Great Depression. Next, the lecture will explore Franklin Roosevelt's set of proposals known as the New Deal. Rather than attempt to describe all the New Deal measures, they will be organized along the lines of the so-called three R's, recovery, relief, and reform programs. Challengers to Roosevelt's ideas had an impact on events as well, so we'll learn about some of Roosevelt's critics. Finally, one thing for you to consider would be an evaluation of the New Deal's legacy. Do you believe this series of programs had a positive or negative impact on the nation? A good place to begin would be with an overview of the general conditions faced by many in the United States at the depth of the Great Depression. I think these tables of statistics show the hard times that the American people faced during the depth of the Great Depression. On the left we see the decline and recovery of the American economy. Notice personal income and gross national product at a low point in 1933. On the right, we see business failures. In 1932, we see the worst year for the numbers of businesses that were failing. The Depression's human toll was seen in the incredibly high unemployment figures in the United States. In 1933, employment nationwide was at about 25%. Some cities were hit even worse. In 1932, Toledo had an unemployment rate of 80%. This table provides more information on the unemployment rates. Beginning in 1929, we see a huge rise in unemployment, and by 1933, 13 million Americans were unemployed. We don't see those unemployment rates dropping dramatically until the early 1940s. Individuals who had invested money in the stock market saw it disappear in October of 1929. The crash began on Black Thursday, October 24th, as prices dropped dramatically. It continued into the next week when a record 16 million stocks were sold on October 29th. The stock market crash came as a surprise to many as the market itself had grown during the 1920s. About 9 million Americans had played the market in that decade. American debt grew during the 1920s and some even borrowed money to invest in the stock market. They were hit with a double blow when the stock market crashed. They had debt and worthless stock. After the dust had settled in mid-November, it was estimated that losses were in the neighborhood of $30 billion. Problems for farmers continued in the decade of the 1930s. The plight of American farmers is portrayed in this painting by Jerry Bywaters. There are many things to consider in this painting. The gray sky, the grasshoppers on the crops, and the sullen expression of the sharecropper himself. Overall, farmers were beset with many problems including, but not limited to, drought, dust, and low prices for their crops. I think these tables provide useful statistics demonstrating the plight facing farmers in the 1930s. 
On the left, we see a tremendous decline in farm product prices beginning in 1929. On the right, we see the number of farm mortgages that had to be renegotiated. Because of this drop in farm prices, many people lost their farms. Economic disaster was followed by ecological disaster on the Great Plains as the Dust Bowl destroyed opportunity for many farmers in the Great Plains. Hardships for farmers were probably worst in the areas identified here on this map. Lack of rainfall combined with severe soil erosion led to disaster for many American farmers. The worst storms of the Dust Bowl took place during every summer between 1934 and 1939. I think we're all familiar with snow drifts. Well, they experienced dust drifts that were often several feet deep. I think these photographs provide a strong visual image of the predicament faced by many American farmers. On the left, we see a photograph by Dorothea Lang of a mother with her children. On the right, we see a tenant family being evicted from their property. I've got a hyperlink below to additional information about Dorothea Lang and many of her photographs. Now we can explore some of the different reactions the American people had to the conditions they faced. As shown by these photographs, some people traveled westward as they looked for more opportunity to better their families. I have a hyperlink below to additional images associated with the Great Depression. Many families traveled via Route 66 to California. It's estimated that over 350,000 traveled to that state looking for jobs. They came from many different states, but most were labeled as Okies, and they didn't find as many opportunities as they had hoped. Many veterans of World War I reacted in a different way. This included the Bonus March. Just a little background to begin with. In the 1920s, Congress rewarded veterans of the First World War with a bonus. This was a payment to be made by the mid-1940s to those veterans. In 1932, as the Depression swept through the nation, about 10,000 marched to Washington, D.C., demanding these former soldiers receive their bonus early. Here we see a photograph of the bonus marchers as they established their so-called tent city with the capital in the background. Many of those World War I veterans brought their families as well. Neither Congress nor President Hoover supported granting the bonus early, so eventually the movement disbanded, even forcefully. However, the American people could not forget the images of about a thousand American soldiers armed with tear gas and bayonets destroying the tent city filled with war veterans and their families. Attitudes began to harden by 1932, and many targeted their anger at President Hoover. His reaction to the bonus marchers seemed to symbolize his lack of concern for the American people. Some began to label their shanty towns Hoovervilles. These were areas where many homeless people built shelters with scraps of wood and metal, and they lived in them. Well, 1932 was also an election year, and the American people could bring about change by voting in a presidential election. Now we can begin a discussion of the New Deal by exploring the profile of the New Deal's architect, Franklin Roosevelt. Here we see a famous photograph of Franklin Roosevelt and outgoing President Herbert Hoover on the day of Roosevelt's inauguration. Roosevelt had an interesting background. He was from New York in a wealthy family, and he was also a distant relative of Theodore Roosevelt. As an adult, he suffered from polio, which was really unique, and the American people knew this, but they didn't know the extent of his disability. This map identifies the Roosevelt landslide of 1932. Notice all of the green on this map. Democrats also gained majorities in the House and the Senate. Franklin's wife was Eleanor Roosevelt, and she became one of the most active first ladies in U.S. history. Here we see her visiting coal miners in West Virginia. 
Mrs. Roosevelt was able to travel to places where her husband could not go due to his disability. There's a hyperlink below to additional information about Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt's philosophy was unique. He had no blueprint to fix the American economy, but he was willing to experiment. If something worked, stick with it. If it didn't, try something else. He was also one of the first presidents to effectively use the media. As a speaker, he often said to people that he had licked polio. The nation, working together, could lick the Great Depression. In his inaugural address, he challenged the American people, and he argued that we had nothing to fear but fear itself. After he assumed the presidency, he embarked on a series of fireside chats where he explained to the American people how he was helping the nation overcome the Great Depression. The New Deal is often referred to as the alphabet soup of American history, as many different lettered agencies were created to fight the Great Depression. It would be impossible to cover all New Deal measures, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break them down into three different areas. The first group I'd like to look at would be recovery programs. The first of the three R's includes the so-called recovery measures. The goal of these programs was to bring about the economic recovery of the nation. There are three examples I'd like to discuss. The EBA, the AAA, and the TVA. Now you know why some people call this the alphabet soup of American history. The EBA, or the Emergency Bank Act, dealt with some of the problems associated with the banking industry in the United States. By early 1933, People had lost faith in the banking system, and they began to hoard their money, which hurt the money supply overall. In the years following the stock market crash, several banks closed their doors. By 1933, over 5,000 banks had folded. If people had their money in those banks, they lost it. This chart on the left shows the increasing number of bank failures in the nation. The Emergency Bank Act was the New Deal's response to the problems with the banking industry. First of all, all banks were required to take a four-day holiday. Secondly, banks were inspected to ensure they were embarking in sound business practices. Weak banks were restructured, but healthy and strong banks were reopened right away. This was an important piece of legislation because it restored people's faith in the banking system as shown by the number of deposits rather than withdrawals after the reopening of those banks. Farmers sought help as well. This photograph shows a series of farmers in 1933 marching on the Capitol in Minnesota. The Agricultural Adjustment Act was the cornerstone of the New Deal's program to help farmers. This had a few main points. First of all, farmers were paid to cut back on their production of certain crops. Secondly, the government bought excess products and kept them in reserve. This was designed to try to bring the price of farm products up so farmers could make a profit. Remember that McNary-Haugen bill that I discussed in the lecture over the 1920s? It was clear that the Agricultural Adjustment Act was influenced by this piece of legislation. However, this time, the President wasn't going to veto it. 
The Agricultural Adjustment Act did help to provide some economic recovery for farmers. However, it tended to benefit large landowners rather than individual sharecroppers who were working on the land. The last recovery measure I'd like to discuss would be the Tennessee Valley Authority. Now the TVA involved the construction of a series of dams in different parts of the impoverished Tennessee Valley. This map shows the Tennessee River watershed and the location of several proposed dams. This construction project would employ thousands, but that wasn't the only justification for the legislation. Another justification for the bill included a desire to control the periodic flooding which plagued people in the Tennessee Valley. Finally, many in the Tennessee Valley didn't have access to electric power because it was so expensive. This would bring cheap electricity to people who previously had none. The second R of the New Deal involves relief measures. Relief programs were designed to provide direct economic relief to the American people, but one of the goals of the New Deal was to provide people with jobs rather than direct handouts. Some good examples of relief measures would include the WPA and the CCC. The Works Progress Administration was probably one of the largest relief agencies established under the New Deal. This is sometimes referred to as an umbrella agency because it employed so many different people in a wide range of projects. Over 120,000 buildings were constructed, whether they be schools, hospitals, post offices, public buildings, or other areas. For the first time in U.S. history, money for the arts was allocated, as many writers, actors, artists were employed in WPA programs. On the left, we see a poster for a play which was produced using WPA funds. On the right, we see a painting by William Gropper. This was also a WPA project. Another New Deal agency that provided relief in the form of jobs was the Civilian Conservation Corps. In many ways, this was one of Franklin Roosevelt's favorite programs because it put people to work and helped the environment at the same time. There were a variety of jobs that they performed. They planted trees, built campgrounds, fish hatcheries, and they even developed hiking trails. The hours were long, the work was hard, and the pay was about $35 a month, but at least people had three square meals and a roof over their head. Many supported these New Deal programs, however, Roosevelt still faced challengers. I'd like to talk about two next. Francis Townsend was a doctor from California who had his plan to end the Great Depression. It focused on an old age pension plan. Here's how it worked. All retirees over the age of 60 would receive a check from the government of $200 a month. The money had to be spent within 30 days. He argued that this increased spending would stimulate the economy and if people over the age of 60 retired, it would open up new jobs for younger workers. There was only one catch. It would have bankrupted the nation very quickly. Huey Long was from Louisiana and he had his plan to end the Great Depression. The name of it was Share Our Wealth and it was designed to address the gap between the very rich and poor in the United States. First of all, he wanted to limit all annual incomes to one million dollars a year. He also wanted to limit personal fortunes to five million dollars a year. What would he do with the money? Well, he would guarantee all American families a homestead of five thousand dollars and an annual income of twenty-five hundred dollars. Well, Congress didn't adopt the program advocated by either Francis Townsend or Huey Long. However, when I talk about the last R, reform measures, we're going to see some of the influence of these challengers. 
Probably the most radical measures included in the New Deal were reform programs. These were designed to reform the system to avoid another Great Depression in the future. Some examples include the SEC, FDIC, and the SSA. There are three reform measures which can be highlighted briefly. First, tax rates for the wealthiest Americans and several businesses were increased under the Wealth Tax Act. These tax increases reflect the influence of Huey Long's ideas. Secondly, the SEC was created. This stood for the Securities and Exchange Commission. It was established to regulate the stock market. Lastly, we see the FDIC, or the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. This protected people's savings accounts up to $5,000. The most wide-ranging reform program included in the New Deal was the Social Security Act. First of all, this established unemployment insurance, which would be funded by employers. This was the first time we had unemployment insurance at the national level. Secondly, there was an aid to dependence clause. Money was set aside for people who couldn't take care of themselves. These included widows, orphans, maybe even people who were blind or disabled in some other way. Third, there was an old age pension plan. This was a program funded by employers and employees. Initial payment estimates weren't all that much. However, it was a way to help people who were retired in the United States. It's really difficult to overestimate the impact of the Social Security Act because it completely altered the relationship between the American people and the national government. In the 1930s, the national government responded to provide direct aid to the American people in a time period during which it was desperately needed. That's why the Social Security Act remains one of the most popular programs ever sponsored by the national government. Now that we've looked at the major programs included in the New Deal, I would like to look at the legacy it's left behind. Roosevelt's New Deal was incredibly popular among a majority of the American people. However, it did not end the Great Depression. While it didn't end the Depression, the policies did help the American people in a time of great need. What it did do, however, was that it established a safety net below which no American would be allowed to fall. While doing so, it established the foundation of the modern welfare state. Maybe you think this is a good thing. Maybe you think that the government should maintain a minimum standard of living. However, maybe you think people should rely on themselves. Well, it's up for you to decide whether the legacy of the New Deal is a positive or a negative for the nation. Well, this concludes the lecture over the Great Depression and New Deal. The next few slides will include hyperlinks to additional sites, as well as sources used for this lecture.